We're going to be watching through the Modern Diogenes, a guide to Slavoj Žižek. This was put out by Sisyphus55 about two years ago. Um, this is a thing that has been gotten recommended to me on my personal YouTube account many times, and I've never clicked through because the title has been kind of, I wouldn't say offensive, but it misses in characterizing Žižek with a comparison to Diogenes. It misses the way in which... Zizek would be critical of Diogenes. For those of you who don't know who Diogenes is, they are contemporary of Plato, and their shtick is in history is really just kind of being a foil to Plato and being a really a general troll. And this is best exampled in an anecdote that I think it's Plato who gives this, but Plato is walking one day to court and he sees Diogenes washing vegetables in the river. As he's crossing the bridge above him, he looks down and he says, you know, Diogenes, if you knew how to play court to kings, you would not have to wash vegetables. And Diogenes, unwashed, mad as a dog, um, turns up, looks at him and is, well, my Plato, if you knew how to wash vegetables in the river, you would not need to play court to kings. And a lot of their interactions kind of play off like that, with Diogenes getting the snappy, quick retort off. Where Zizek, or more aptly where Hegel, would be critical of a figure like Diogenes, is that they occupy what for Hegel is the position of the rebel. That is to say, somebody that has no content of their own, but only gains content by what they are actively negating. So the rebel is situates themselves in relation to the state. That is the the point of social universality and says basically no to every yes. And that is where they get their content. And and Zizek would decry that as uh, on several different terms. And if this video plays heavily into this comparison to Diogenes, we'll come back and we'll uh, look at this further. If nobody can agree on what someone has said. Have they really said anything at all? In the realm of philosophical and theological texts, the answer is more or less yes. The boundless interpretations of the Bible and Hegel should not undermine the depth and insight of such works. But what about the public intellectual? Those who either willingly or accidentally find themselves thrust into the arena of popular discourse. The comprehension of their work is now undoubtedly a responsibility. As Alan Lightman writes, such a person must be careful. He must be aware of the limitations of his knowledge. He must acknowledge his personal prejudices because he is being asked to speak for a whole realm of thought. He must be aware of the huge possible consequences of what he says and writes and does. He has become, in a sense, public property because he represents something large to the public. He has become an idea himself, a human striving. He has enormous power to influence and change, and he must wield that power with respect. And then there's the strange phenomena of Slavoj Žižek, who's right. With what they said just there, I want to kind of play that out a little more because it's a very interesting thought. And you see this tension, especially in uh, Freud and Lacan. Freud, if anybody, I've said this before on this channel, Freud is an incredibly accessible person to read. You can pick up Freud and not be too put off by the language he uses. And nor you can get something out of Freud by reading him. Whereas with, say, uh, uh, Hegel, if you pick up Hegel for the first time without knowing what's going on in Hegel, it's incomprehensible. And Lacan goes through, Lacan is another psychoanalyst uh, and psychiatrist heavily inspired by Freud. In Lacan's reading of Freud in the 1930s, as he's kind of entering into his profession as a psychiatrist, is he feels that the predominant read of Freud, that is ego psychiatry, gets Freud wrong. And he said, and in part, he thinks it's because Freud is too easy to read. It is easy to get a meaning out of Freud. And since you can get a meaning, it's easier to come away with a meaning that is more influenced by what you're bringing to the table as the person who is reading the book than what the person writing the book is actually trying to say. And with this, Lacan, it, Lacan, when he was teaching, he his main form of dissemination of knowledge was his seminars, in which he is just talking and in a very similar uh, comparison to uh, live streams and video content, it's an active engagement and play with the audience. Whereas in his written work, The Accrete, he is obtuse 
and very difficult to read. And the point of this difficulty is to ensure on a certain, and this is kind of a narcissistic point from him, but to prevent misreading uh, as much as that can be prevented. The to fame appears to be directly correlated with his strange polemic and intentional contradiction. Those who hear of him may vaguely like or... I also wouldn't, uh, I don't think I'd say that he is intentionally contradictory. Um, what I would say against a lot of the clips of Slavoj Žižek that you can find on the internet is when they are taken as clips and as things without the backdrop of his greater thought and work, it's very easy for somebody to go through, watch, and engage with them and come away with the wrong idea of what he is saying because of the vehemency with which he speaks out against things such as identity politics. Dislike his thought, summing up their views with the obligatory, I don't really know what he's about. So who is he, and what is he about? Slavoj Žižek was born into a middle-class family in Soviet-era Yugoslavia. His father, an economist, and his mother, an accountant, were both devout atheists. Žižek remembers his childhood as being generally an unhappy one. He stated, I read alone, a Freudian retreat that prepared me for the world and all its disgusting obscenity. As he grew older, Zizek spent much of his time in a coastal town where he would become acquainted with various Western films and pop culture. This exposure led Zizek into pursuing a career in filmmaking, but after reading Hegel, he felt obliged to study philosophy. During the liberalization movement in Yugoslavia, Zizek took up studying philosophy and sociology, excelling in both fields. He published the very first translation of a Derrida text into Slovenian and began to publish articles in alternative magazines. The political atmosphere of the time, however, did not allow for Zizek to gain tenure, as his master's thesis wasn't considered Marxist enough. Starting in 1981, Zizek studied under Jacques Alain Miller, the son-in-law of the famous French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. One of Zizek's main philosophical projects, the merging of Lacanian psychoanalysis with Hegelian philosophy, likely started here. Zizek spent much of the 80s editing and translating Freud and Lacan, as well as using Lacan's work to interpret Marx and Hegel. After publishing his dissertation, Zizek spent a few years in what he called professional wilderness. He spent four years in the Yugoslav army and then four years unemployed. He would soon become involved in various civil and political movements, joining and then quitting the Communist Party of Slovenia in 1988. He left largely due to what he felt was its love of militarism. In 1989, Zizek published The Sublime Object of Ideology, his first book in English. An excellent book that I would encourage everybody to go out and read. Very similar to Freud, he offers up even to the most philosophically uninitiated, if you power through what you don't understand, there is enough juicy bits throughout that book that can keep kind of anybody sustained through it in which he unites psychoanalysis with pop culture in order to explore the question of human agency in a postmodern world he became an internationally recognized intellectual shortly after its public okay i don't know if that's how i would sum up the book what's important for zizek is this question of how do we why do we believe the things that we believe and this book is Zizek going out and trying to articulate what ideology is from a formal perspective. That is to say, from the universal structuring apparatuses of it, as opposed to the myriad particular forms it can be recognized and realized in. Publication. Zizek then went on to co-found the Liberal Democratic Party and even ran unsuccessfully as its... Notably, um, one of his least favorite parts about the sublime object nowadays is how, at points, very pro-democracy it is. Uh, he views that as the biggest failing of the book, and I would generally agree, as his arguments for why democracy is better fail to uh, escape the way that he very rightfully condemns the so-called people's democracies across the globe. Basically, in short, his argument is that these people's democracies presuppose who the people are. And so in the People's Democratic Republic of China, um, I think that's their, their full name, but within modern-day China, the people, who the people are, is 
presuppose and it's who does it whoever doesn't fit that mold of the people that is then ostracized uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. but this gesture this movement of creating the people is the movement of uh, democracy par excellence as no matter what system of voting you want to institute no matter how you want to split up you look at the problems of gerrymandering and the problems of um, first past the poll ranked choice whatever the different forms of voting you want all of those moves ultimately have are have effects of as a predicate saying who is participating in this democracy candidate in 1990 in 2003 he wrote text for a series of abercrombie and fitch ads in response <laughs> the only successful sexual relationship occurs when the fantasies of the two partners overlap if the man fantasizes that walking that making love is like riding a bike and the woman wants to be penetrated by a stud then what truly goes on while they make love is that a horse is riding a bike with a fantasy like that who needs a personality now this is classic Zizekian obscenity par excellence but to kind of give you an idea of what i mean when i say without the backdrop of his thought this this sort of thing is just simply can just simply be obscene and utilized i don't know poorly a turn of phrase that uh the philosopher and analyst jacques lacan is is fond of is there is no sexual relation and what that means is anytime two people are fucking there is no immediacy there is no like raw contact that is happening instead what is happening is the simultaneous projection of fantasy onto your part and so that when you may have a sexual encounter with your uh sex partner you are having a sec you are having an encounter with your object of fantasy and all that matters is the ability to project that onto the partner your partner does not need to be aware of or complicit in it they just need to not um disrupt that ability to project it onto them the many accusations that he had sold out Zizek responded if I were asked to choose between doing things like this to earn money and becoming fully employed as an American academic, kissing ass to get a tenured position, I would with pleasure choose writing for such journals. In 2008, Zizek defined himself as a communist in a qualified sense and a radical leftist, as he was becoming increasingly political in much of his work. In 2016... So, when Zizek says that he's a communist, I, I like the way he goes about it. He makes the distinction between socialism which is all that has ever been achieved by any of the socialist democracies that have sprung up across the globe and communism the thing that all of those governments say they are pursuing and he identifies himself with the fantasy that has escaped realization he identifies and he'll continue to say that notionally the term communist stands for the the total negation of the current political sphere it is all of the things that are impossible in this current um world and zizek's main philosophical project for the last 30 40 years has been how asking the question of what is the new commun socialism has failed us how can we go forward what is the theoretical apparatus that we need in order to create a new way of relating to each other socially seeing he would controversially endorse trump for presidency providing conflicting reasons behind such an endorsement in the same year he would also write a controversial article entitled the sexual is political in regards to the the trump endorsement his position ultimately is that it would be, for lack of a better term, disruptive, and it would expose the gaps in our social order that we have been trying to cover up today. And if we look at the after effects of the Trump presidency and the way that those gaps in the social order have been greatly have been aggravated by Trump's presidency, the way in which America was unable to re-enter the global political stage in the same way after the Trump presidency, the way in which political obstacles that were 
once legitimate concerns for liberals are no longer ideological defenses for them are a result of the Trump presidency. In which he argues that despite its attempts at deconstructing normative sexuality, transgenderism will never fully develop its own ontology. The article was considered Eurocentric and discriminatory within some left-leaning circles. In 2019, Zizek debated the psychology professor. So in regards to the trans ideology bit, frankly, I think there are trans scholars in the same field of thought as Zizek. And I think that um, Zizek's realization is that it is simply better for him not to weigh in there at all. He's recognizing that he is not the voice for certain ears and is, is thus fixed. We'll see if he comes back to it and we'll go more into it if he makes it more of a point. Sir Jordan Peterson over happiness under capitalism, an economic system, and Marxism, a method of socioeconomic analysis. Regarding Zizek's infamous ticks, he... This is a wonderful debate that I love, and people should go and watch it if you haven't. But ultimately, Zizek is very skeptical of happiness, and especially as happiness as a goal or a fantasy. Uh, as happiness is only the fleeting bit of satisfaction that you get, when after you get something you want what we what we ought to strive for in the the sense of freud is uh normal common everyday unhappiness he stated that they may have developed from some form of neuroticism however he has also said this i especially hate when they my students come to me with personal problems my standard line is look at me look at my tics don't you see that i'm mad Zizek's writing style is perhaps unmatched in its unique and contradictory process, pairing Blade Runner with Kant or Christianity with the toy in the middle of a kinder egg. It's more, this is one of Zizek's strengths in that everything is up for debate and everything can be a, a theoretical example. You do not need to be stuffy about things. You do not simply need to write on Antigone and um and Wagner. And you can see this also expressed in the work of other Lacanian Hegelians. Todd McGowan uses Zootopia multiple times as a theoretical tool in his book on universality. Zizek utilizes what he calls short circuits to arrive at unexpected and striking insights. This is not simply to connect the dots between two topics, however. As Zizek explains, the reader should not simply have learned something new. The point is rather to make him or her aware of another disturbing side of something he or she knew all the time. This style works well in his main project, the analysis of ideology. By ideo the, uh, Interesting that you didn't predicate this element in when you're talking about sublime object. Okay. Zizek uses the Marxist term of false consciousness to describe it. In other words, I... Mm. Okay, no, but ideology is the various ways in which certain social processes mislead certain class actors within capitalist societies yeah no because if anybody as everybody who has seen that uh debate between the <clears throat> the race fetishist Bosch and um luna oy's uh fluffy husband the the notion of ideological mystification doesn't really give doesn't really give marxists uh, a big tool to use in saying that in, in critiquing and discussing ideology, because as you can see, all you can do is really just cry and yell uh, mystification, false consciousness, false consciousness. Uh, Zizek's point is that ideology is our spontaneous relationship to the world. Ideology is the predicate to us being able to understand the world writ large. It is the first requirement for logic and reason. Doing so in order to conceal the exploitation intrinsic to social relations between such classes. Simply put, ideology is unconscious and allows for the unconscious justification of exploitative systems. But why is ideology so effective? Zizek argues that reality is experienced by us in a way that is unable to satisfy our craving for meaning. Instead, humans experience reality through the frame of various systems of power. Ideology is the frame that satisfies. Okay. No. This is uh, this is this guy's Foucauldianism bleeding into his reading of Zizek, but it's by systems of enjoyment and the way that enjoyment is structured by language. It's not about power. 
justifies this meaning. However, as Zizek notes, the fact that ideology cannot account for all of reality lends to the fact that ideological rationalizations will pile up to the point in which contradictions are generated. Contradictions for Zizek are a good signifier in identifying an ideology. For example, he notes the ideology bound in the slave era American South, where black people were simultaneously seen as childlike innocents and brutal predators. Okay, so I've said this before, and I don't feel like this is enough of a notional uh, thing to chew on. Um, and so I'm just going to go through it again. The way ideology works is at the head, you have a master signifier. For Freud, it's called the phallus. For Lacan, it's the master signifier. And the master signifier to use the ideology of Christian fundamentalism is God. You can think of it as God. It is the void that structures all meaning around it. Um, then emanating out from that, you can think of it as webs of words echoing out from the master signifier. And this is referred to as the chain of signification. And it's through the relationship of all of these words to themselves that uh, words writ large gain meaning. Um, and this is how you can have a fascist say freedom is one thing and a communist say freedom is another thing. And both can feel like they have an objective relationship to what freedom means. And what ends this chain of signification is what is referred to as the quilting point, which is what he's talking about here, which and this takes its uh, inspiration from the notion of Russell's paradox uh, in in relation to set theory, but I'm not going to go into it all there. But basically, in order for the rest of the ideological sphere to have meaning, all of the contradiction of meaning has to be concentrated into one point. And so this example of uh, African individuals in antebellum South, um, or even, you know, uh, further on in history, um, or the Jew for Nazi ideology, or the immigrant for us today, the notion of the Mexican immigrant. All of these are contradictory figures who are at the one time um, schemers, masterminds, and hardworking um, exploiters, and at the other time, lazy, uh, irresponsible uh, people who need uh, parenting or addressing by the state. I... Likewise, and so far, I'm kind of glad I've never watched this video. Contemporary America, Zizek highlights the anti-immigration ideology where Mexican immigrants are seen as lazy burdens on the welfare system as well as relentless workaholics who are taking jobs from Americans. Zizek works his own contradictions into his writing, using paradox as a strategy in order to convey certain ideas. He'll introduce one idea, appearing to agree with it, and then swiftly suggest that it is in fact entirely wrong. Okay, this is true, and it makes Zizek both hard to read and hard to listen to. These reversals are part of a strategy to keep the thought in motion. Instead of proposing a solution or finding a resting place, Zizek relentlessly seeks out further conflicts and contradictions, carrying out what Marx called the ruthless criticism of everything existing. The goal is not to arrive at a settled view, but to achieve greater clarity about what is really at issue, about what is really at stake in a given debate. For Zizek, ideology is an answer to an underlying reality that is inherently contradictory. By analyzing ideologies, we can reach these contradictions and perhaps gain further insight into what the true conflict is. Mm, no. 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 Any notion of there being a true conflict, any notion of... Uh, you can see this uh, naivety in the media's relationship to Donald Trump. They They keep on thinking that they can point out that the emperor has no clothes when... In fact, the true gesture is to point at someone who is already wearing clothes and say, oh man, how dare they? Don't they know they're, they're completely naked underneath all of those clothes? What he just articulated, Zizek would call, I think, in a certain sense, uh, fundamentally paranoid. It assumes that there is another scene going on somewhere where people are getting the the full story, the full scope. You can, you can see this structure at work with QAnon people as, as they or anti-vaxxers as in as opposed to identifying with the social reality they assume that on another scene there is this complete and whole existence that they can uh, identify with but however this uh, active and restless philosophy rejects simply understanding that one is operating within an ideology 
It is not enough to merely know that you are being lied to, particularly when continuing to live a normal life under capitalism. Although one may possess a self-awareness, just because one understands what one is doing does not mean that one is doing the right thing. Another, they know not what they are doing, but nonetheless they are doing it. The, that notion from Marx is a notion about ideology that Zizek would, I think, uh, continue to support. He argues that this is due to fetishization, explained as followed. I know well that, for example, the shoe is only a shoe, but nevertheless I still need my partner to wear the shoe in order to enjoy it. Regarding ideological fetishization, Zizek draws this comparison. <laughs> I know well that, for example, Bob Hawke, Bill Clinton, the party, the market, does not always act justly, but I still act as though I did not know that this is the case. This is another thing that I don't think is that hard to explain. And so the way that you talk around it does it a disservice. So for what a fetish is, from a Lacanian, Zizekian point of view, remember that system of... Uh, master signifier chain of signification quilting point that is at its most reductive that is the the scope of ideology and basically in order to ignore the fact that the quilting point is contradictory ideology utilizes fantasy and provides us with fantasies to obscure the way in which our worldview is contradictory and you can see like the phantasmatic uh, projections on to you know, like racial identities throughout the course of uh, American existence is a great example of that sort of fantasy. A fetish is the last thing that you resort to before that ideological system crumbles away. It is the last thing before you are confronted with the the contradictions in your ideological scope writ large. And you can play this out really perfectly with the notion of the liberal civility fetish. The liberal governance, the liberal ideology, its last line of defense against what is ultimately contradictory in itself, which is the way in which uh, liberalism, despite all of the ways it wants to pretend that it is, is a very violent and uncivil political philosophy and so the last resort of people like uh, people who are ready to accept that you know maybe the cops are racist pigs and killers but we still need to civilly discuss with them the way to go through and make their role in society better he at least got this question or got this structure correct in as far as the notion of fetishistic disavowal is this i know very well that x nonetheless why it's like you know i know very well that all cops are evil but nonetheless we ought to go through and try and su um, support the good ones if you keep an eye out for this structure in in anybody's speech it's this is a, always a good thing to look out for due to the fetishizing of ideology environmentalism liberalism communism and so on and so on Zizek argues that each ideology acts in an attempt to not actually usher forth any true change. Hence, Zizek rejects the claim that we live in a post-ideological world. The idea in itself, he argues, is what he calls an archideological fantasy. Or, uh, I think a better way to rephrase that is the notion that we live in a post-ideological world is ideology par excellence. Uh, and, again, from the space of 2020 to 2022... It's becoming increasingly clear, I think, commonly, to phrase this in uh, Zizekian, the big other is beginning to recognize that we don't live in a post-ideological world. He explains that the term ideology is generally used in a negative sense, and so no one taken by an ideology would ever seriously believe that they've been duped. Instead, those entrenched with an ideology would have had to have bought into it under the assumptions that such beliefs were non-ideological and sensible. One of the best methods of convincing someone that something is non-ideological is by stating that it is outside of the matter of political contestation. For example, the American two-party system has created the illusion that such a form of representation is natural, and from this the subject has become depoliticized. The two-party system is seen as a fact. Doing so moves attention away from the idea that other parties and systems could exist, that it's non-ideological. Zizek's... Um, I don't really have anything to say about that per se, but one point, and I can't remember if this is G a Zizekian point or if it's Todd McGowan who says this, but any time an ideology relegates something to the beyond, to 
the impossible. That is going to be the stumbling block that we that they are always going to pull out. So it's like anytime um, they whatever has been relegated to the impossible is going to be what makes everything impossible. And this is why Zizek is, in his own words, in love with fought with uh, lost causes and thinks we all ought to be in support of lost causes. And a great way that this can be translated into um, political praxis is uh, trying to act, trying to get the left to act in the same way that the right does. Uh, during 2016, they or during Trump's presidency, they passed uh, tax reform or uh, they cut taxes for the rich uh, without any justification for it. It was really just that we feel like doing this and we have the political power to do so. And you're beginning to see Biden do this, which is, I think, one of the few things good I would say about him is uh, is to stop ceding things to this uh, civility fetish. More political work reveals an idiosyncratic take on Marxism. He argues that class struggle should not define the struggle between the working class and capitalists. In fact, he sees such a struggle as the fallout of capitalism. Zizek instead claims that the real conflict is the system itself. There were rich people and poor people before capitalism. This is not new. However, what <laughs> capitalism has introduced is a massive population of landless laborers who are forced to sell their labor to survive, and a class of elites that are happy to extract profits from this free labor. Despite his Marxist leanings, Zizek does not believe in historical necessity. As he puts it, there is no such thing as the communist big other, there is no historical necessity or teleology directing and guiding our actions. Zizek has been criticized on numerous fronts. One of the most common is from those who feel he is unable to articulate his ideas in a meaningful way. As Roger Scruton wrote, to summarize Zizek's position is not easy. He slips between philosophical and psychoanalytical ways. But, and we'll see if he goes on to this. Uh, Noam Chomsky hates Zizek. He views him as a charlatan and is actively trying, at least according to Zizek, is actively going about in the uh, academic world and academic world in the academy and spreading rumors that he is racist. And what is ironic about this is ultimately Lacan philosophically is the last bastion of enlightenment reason. It is an attempt to continue forward the project of the Enlightenment it, with the recognition that humanity is not the master of their own mental function. That is to say, we are undermined by our very subjectivity. We are not pure cogito, as Descartes would have us think. We are instead divided, split naked and Lacan and Lacan's work and Zizek's work with the continuation of the German idealist project vis-a-vis -vis psychoanalysis is one of how can we how do we reason ways of arguing and is spellbound by Lacan's gnomic utterances likewise Chomsky has stated that Zizek is guilty yeah uh Chomsky wrote one not really even that great book outside of his, um, uh, frankly, his academic lane, and has frankly just been an anti-communist liberal in, his, in the entirety of his uh, political existence. I'm sorry, fuck Noam Chomsky. ...of using fancy terms like polysyllables and pretending you have a theory when you have no theory whatsoever. In his debate with Peter... Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky is a naive Kantian who has, uh, who is uh, uh, still fetishizing the thing in itself. And Zizek was also accused of offering no solutions, criticizing both Marxism and capitalism, while Peterson had at least attempted to explain the merits of capitalism. Zizek has also been accused of plagiarizing his own work numerous times, recycling passages of his books in his other books. On a more theoretical level, Zizek has been accused of overextending Lacanian psychoanalysis when discussing politics. Many of his books are titled in such a way as to give off the impression that he might be writing about technology or populism, only to be filled with endless pages on Lacanian views of sexuality. 
When Zizek does comprehensively venture into the political realm, he has found himself accused of radical views by both the left and right. In one instance, Zizek argues that the West must come to terms with the fact that it has caused the refugee crisis and that the morally acceptable thing is to open its doors to refugees. He also states that the West should deal with the root cause of the crisis by stopping its destructive policies in the developing world. However, he also notes that the West should open its doors in spite of the fact that refugees are incompatible with the culture of the West. Ultimately, where Zizek runs awry of the left, and it's funny because ContraPoints is running awry of the left for the exact same reason, though I, uh, I don't know if they consciously recognize this. When you recognize that there is not going to be a, like, China is not going to achieve communism, um, the socialist project, communism has been attempted in as far as the, ap the direct application of Marxist thought. It has been attempted, and there is no uh, appeals of saying, oh, they didn't get it right, they did it wrong for X, Y, and Z reason. One of Zizek's key points is, however something attempts to be realized, that is the results of its realization. There is no appeals of saying, oh, uh, no, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't correct in this way, it wasn't true communism, yada, yada, yada. You have to reconcile yourself with the facts of the reality of socialism across the globe. Zizek likes to make a big point of the way that, like, for example, Ho Chi Minh was greatly influenced by Thomas Jefferson, which is from the position of an American, that's a that's kind of like a, a it makes you double take. Right. Right. But we in the same way that uh, socialist projects around the world looked to the most radical of uh, of thinkers in liberalism to inform their thoughts, we still need to go through and look at the the political thoughts of those who have tried to um, step out of li liberalism and truly lo learn from the failures of of global leftist politics and so that's why zizek will run awry a lot with the left as uh, he is neither a a feel-good social democrat type who simply wants to um consume their way out of the ethical ethical issues of consumption as such or the uh, the anti-liberal leftist who thinks that the real communist state is just around the corner. Zizek is interested about places in which ideology is, where places of negativity erupt in ideology. Citing the Islamic opposition to free speech and subordination of women. The refugees want to have their cake and eat it. They basically expect to get the best of the Western welfare state while retaining their specific way of life which is in some of its key features incompatible with the ideological foundations of the Western welfare state. Zizek has been called out for contradicting his own argument against Islamic opposition of free speech, as he has previously advocated for the criminalization of any discussion on the use of nuclear weapons. His claims of the subordination of women in Islam has also been criticized for its overgeneralization, as Zizek had only cited the New Year's assaults in Cologne as evidence. Zizek's support of Trump has also bewildered his critics. He initially stated that he supported Trump because it would trigger a process of radicalization for the Democratic Party. Which it kinda did. I want right-wing chaos so that the new left will save us from it. Not only does this contradict his consistent rejection of historical necessity... You see, it... It doesn't, though. It's... there Because there is no... Yeah, this is... Uh, this is... I don't want this to be a longer video. Um, let's, let's get what you said back. Wildered his critics. He initially stated that he supported Trump because it would trigger a process of radicalization for the Democratic Party. I want right-wing chaos so that the new left will save us from it. Not only does this contradict his consistent rejection of historical necessity, it also goes against another characterization. Yeah, this is, it's the difference between historical necessity and negativity when he says the the new left what he means and this is something that i agree with is at it is only whether it is by means of the pressures of global warming 
the the fall of the United States and half of Europe to fascism or what have you. What's at the core of his point to borrow his comparison to um to Wagner in in Sublime Object of Ideology. The the spear that made the wound is the only thing that can heal it. Basically, as the growing forces of oppression and inequality continue to condense and solidify globally, the negation to that and what that looks like only comes further into focus. And again, Zizek at his truly philosophical core be mistaken for someone who lacks a rigorous philosophical project. I'm trying to think of a way to articulate this without just sounding pretentious the only way to go through and understand something is by moving through your own misunderstanding an example of zizek that he likes is that of pride and prejudice elizabeth and darcy both immediately misunderstand each other on their first encounter darcy thinking uh elizabeth to be an airhead little bimbo and uh, elizabeth thinking darcy to be a an uptight asshole and a, a classist and it is only through them moving through their misunderstanding of each other through the book to come to an actual understanding and appreciation of who the other person is, that their love relationship can actually be founded. And this goes for Hegel and the people who, inspired by Zizek, uh, Joan Kopchek, uh, Todd McGowan, Alenka Zupanchik, Miladin Dolar, uh, Fabio Vichy, there are myriad people working in this space now yeah i'm 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 i don't know what i'm trying to say against your video but i don't like it mate gave of trump that he's a centrist liberal that won't be as much of a threat as proposed by his opponents zizek has also been criticized for his stance on transgenderism in one article titled transgender dogma is naive and incompatible with freud zizek argues that sexual identity is a choice but not a conscious choice here he reflects Lacan's idea that sex is a violent but unavoidable imposition, not something that can be playfully transformed or repeated. In The Sexual is Political, Zizek also states that LGBT people will never be able to fully get away from normative heterosexual relations. On this point, he's been criticized for claiming that transgender people give heterosexual individuals anxiety as their existence disrupts and threatens the binaries used to organize gender identity. Zizek responded, claiming that such an interpretation is incorrect and asserting that such an anxiety is already present with or without transgender people. Zizek argues that he was attempting to make a larger issue more apparent. Is sexuality the object of or the obstacle to emancipation? In conclusion, there's a book, it's called Post Queer Theory. Um, and kind of what I was saying before, I think Zizek backed off on this and simply let other people working in the same notional space to say it for him. Zizek could be seen as the mascot for the self hating liberal, a thinker so aware of the potential pitfalls of all beliefs and values that he leaves us with no solutions. And so those who read him are left with the empty feeling that they are smart enough to know about the issues around them, but too dumb to do anything about it. With regards to his critique of political correctness, Zizek can also be seen as an idiosyncratic bridge between left and right-wing discourse, willing to interrogate and pick apart areas that many academic leftists would never dare to try. Nonetheless, his inclusion of pop culture and dirty jokes into his lectures and books do offer a valuable portal for those who would have never touched a philosophy book to begin with. His provocative comparisons and insights demonstrate that philosophy truly is boundless in its association and expression of ideas, in its propensity for creativity. This propensity for fun association can sometimes take a dark and radical turn, however, a possibility that should never be forgotten. But this is perhaps Zizek's greatest achievement, his ability to assert himself as a contradiction. In his ruthless criticism of everything existing, Zizek has been accused of saying extremely radical things and nothing worthy of discussing, simultaneously, whereas others have used ambiguous phrasing and terms to simply generate enough semantic and contextual space to accuse their opponents of misrepresentation. It appears that the very ambiguity of Zizek's work is essential to his point, that discussing reality and truth entails the absence of all attempts at solutions or answers. And in instead, requires a rather laborious and futile journey through Robocop references and jokes about dog poop. <laughs> I 
Okay. Yeah, I really... I did not like the video. I think I went through, and we'll see after I edit this, if I still think that I went through and gave good reasons for why I didn't like this video. Sisyphus55, if you have a later video that you think is a better take on, on, on Zizek, or is more representative of your thought, ultimately I either disagree with your understanding of Zizek, or what you understood to be important to disseminate about Zizek. I'm going to go through, and I'm starting work right after this on an essay um, about ideology and quantum leap, as I think quantum leap is an examination of ideology par excellence. And I'm hoping that the new series ends up being all right. Uh, again, I'm glad I didn't watch this until I'm going to try and uh, carve some content out of it.